Welcome to today's Corporate Venturing Insider Series. Today, I'm very happy to have Arvind, who is a head of City Ventures with us. Arvind, welcome. Thanks for having me, Nicola. So let's start with your journey into corporate venturing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think you, were, you and I were speaking earlier, there's not one path. And, and in my case, uh, I used to be at an institutional venture firm called Menlo Ventures. So just to start at the beginning, I have a technical background. I went to school to do electrical engineering. I became a semiconductor guy. Uh, and then I came to the United States to do grad school and, uh, and then came to work at Intel as a chip designer. So um, the first two years, I was a chip designer uh, working on mobile Pentium products. And then after about two years, I moved over to program management. So I was the guy trying to um, launch new products. And in this case, these were mobile Pentium 2 chips for laptops. Mm -hmm. um, and I did that for about two, two and a half years um, and really um, got into the world of new products, thinking about customers, launch timeframes, what it takes to launch, what it takes to enable uh, an entire ecosystem, right? If you think about these chips, these chips is this one chip that goes into an entire platform. Yeah. And so you're shipping a new chip, which means that the entire platform needs to be ready. It's a hardware plus software product. It needs to be extensively tested. And then only then, several weeks later, does it actually get to market. So what does it take to actually uh, plan something like that and launch it? I think it was just incredible learnings for me uh, uh, of just working in a, you know, an excellent company like Intel, a top of the line performer, very, very well, well run. It, this, I was there between 1995 and, and, uh, and 1999. And then subsequently I went to business school and after business school, I ended up uh, thinking about going into venture capital. You know, there was um, always that entrepreneurial bug in me, and, but I was also very curious about venture. So I ended up going to one of the, the uh, older firms in Silicon Valley called Menlo Ventures. The Menlo was started in 1976. And I went there because I really liked the people, um, you know, really smart people, but also a very collegial environment. And I felt like I would learn a lot. Yeah. So I was there for nine and a half years. I was a partner in two funds. And then about the 20, 2010 timeframe um, is when um, City was looking to beef up its corporate venture program. And it was also the time when Menlo was, you know, rolling off of Fund 10 and going into Fund 11. So I decided it was a good time to be uh, to be leaving uh, Menlo. And what excited me about uh, City Ventures at that point in time were a few things. One is um, this intersection of financial services and technology. Um, I had always been interested in it. I'd made a few investments in it, even in my prior life at, at Menlo. Uh, Menlo itself had had an ex in some experience in the, the world of fintech, though it was not called that at that point in time. And, and I just felt that, you know, the back end, you know, think about, you know, the uh, reporting, analytics, all the servers and compute and everything that, that banks run, banks were always early adopters of technology, especially for the back end. Um, every enterprise company we used to, to invest in would really care about their financial services customers because they tend to be the largest customers. Um, but now it was clear with sort of the web 1.0 of, of you know, online banking and such that even the front end was going to be very important for financial services. And so because of that, um, I uh, was excited about, about the opportunity. Um, the second is um, just the dynamics of being at a venture capital firm versus being at a large corporate like City. City can be a very, at that point in time, I thought City can be a very attractive platform for startups. If you're at Menlo or if you're at any one of those top tier firms, um, and you're trying to lead a Series A or to lead a Series B, you know, typically there is one lead for yeah. a round. Um, and it's a competitive market and you get, you know, you win your share of great companies, great investments, um, and it's good. Um, I felt like with from a corporate angle, you can actually get even better access to the best companies out there. You won't have the same ownership, presumably, but I really was excited about working with the best companies. I was excited about financial services. The word fintech was not broadly applied back then. Um, and so I decided to, um, to, 
to come to city because I thought that the value proposition was was different. Now, when I this was in 2011 is when I started, there was still a lot of I mean the global corporate venturing ecosystem was a lot smaller, yes. a lot smaller back then, and there was still a lot of negative baggage you know that the corporate VCs had you know corporates ask for these special terms they're hard to work with they uh, move at a very slow pace yada 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 so I think one of the things that I did after coming on board here and you know by the way my wife used to be at Intel Capital for seven years so I'd learned a little bit about that just by talking to her so when I came on board here I think the 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 thing that we wanted to design and put together was really first of all be very easy for startups to work with operate like any other VC from an investment standpoint try to be fully aligned with the other syndicate team you know members so mm -hmm. that you're not asking for you know rights of first refusal on an acquisition you're not asking for rights of first notification you're not asking for exclusivity periods mm -hmm. and you know luckily for us city was very supportive very understanding of why we were thinking the way we were thinking and we were able to set up a program where we were able to make these investments in you know quickly um we were able to um have terms that were substantially similar to terms that that their institutional VCs had, um, and and that way the incentives were aligned, right? So anyway, that's how I came to to City Ventures yep. and got started uh, at the in the in the position that I'm right now. I have so many questions, but I'll start with the education because it's earlier. But it's also a very nice mix because you have an engineering background and then you went to a business school. How much of that blend or that mix is helping you today? You know, it's a, it's a great question, Nicola, and I sometimes think about it. You know, I have kids and I talk to them about it as well. Um, you know, the for the kind of work that we do, whether it's in financial services or software, you don't necessarily need that deep technical background that, that, I, that I have. Um, I think for earlier stage investing, for example, in enterprise companies, I think it's useful to have a software background. Um, but then for financial services companies and fintech, sometimes it's better to have actually a financial services background, right? So how do I think about sort of having an engineering and a technical background and how it helps me today? I think the way it helps me is having been in the industry for a little while, the technology changes are very easy for me to understand. Whether it was, um, whether it's AI today or whether it was APIs, you know, a few years ago or whether it's you know, cloud compute or whatever else it is, those kinds of things are very easy for me to understand. Um, and it also gets me to, you know, the question of how very, very quickly, right? So you like a story, I, I tend to focus on the how. How do you make it work? How does this work? How does that work? And that my engineering brain naturally goes to uh, those, those kinds of questions. And that's sort of how I like to invest. You know, I understand the value proposition, yes. I understand the business model, yes. But then how do you make it all work? And that's yeah. something that I tend to, to focus on quite, quite a bit. Um, but I think, you know, in, in, in the world that we live in today, you don't need an engineering background to be successful in venture. And some of the best venture capitalists were not engineers. Um, and, and I, you know, I think we, if there are certain areas of technology where you're investing in maybe deep tech or you're investing in enterprise infrastructure and you're doing early stage, I think it's helpful to have a deep understanding of tech and software and how things are progressing. But for a lot of other things, I think it's it's just a different skill set to um, to learn how to learn quickly yep. um, and to get smart about new areas quickly, to understand what's important, what's not important, so that in the long run, I think venture is a somewhat generalist business, right? You can't be um, super focused on a narrow, a narrow area because every technology has some sort of an S-curve. So what do you get? What do you do when you get to that flatter part of the S-curve? So just from a career standpoint, I you know encourage even people on the team to be more generalist. Um, to give you an example on that, when I first started at, at Menlo, uh, I started to make semiconductor investments. And then after a few years, Semiconductor investments and fabulous semiconductor companies became hard to do um, because of mass cost, because of all you know many other challenges, and so that's when I started to to uh, move into enterprise infrastructure, 
software, storage, things of that nature. Um, and then I started to move up the stack, if you will. And, and so having that agility uh, to be able to move into new areas is an important skill in venture. Actually, the key word is agility. How do you get to the bottom of the S-curve before it's too obvious? Right. I also like the, and I think it's a golden nugget, which is asking the how. Because as you probably go through these questions, you get to understand how the entrepreneur is thinking about it. That's right. That's the, and, and in asking those questions, um, I've had, you know, entrepreneurs that you think have a, you know, great technical background, but who struggle to explain why something works, how something works, not being able to put it in terms that, you know, I'm able to understand. And when that happens, you always wonder about um, the technology underpinnings of a particular startup. I think people who are, people who are the, the, the best entrepreneurs, I feel like, are able to explain it in a very simple way, no matter how complicated the subject matter is. That synthesis and being able to present it is a very important skill. And one of the things I learned very early on in my venture career is how um, entrepreneurship, and especially the CEO's job, is a 24-7 sales job. Exactly. Right? Towards customers as well as investors. and Yeah. I mean, I actually think of it as a 360-degree sales job. In the early days, you're trying to convince co-founders to come and work with you. Then you're trying to convince, like, you know, top-tier employees to come and work with you. You're even work, you know, trying to convince, I mean, this is now the old days, so I'm dating myself, but <laughs> trying to convince landlords to, to lease you space as a, as a small company. Uh, and of course, investors and customers and all the rest. So it's a 360 degree sales job. So, um, you know, there were times early on in my career where I'd go through the story, I'd love it. The entrepreneur doesn't tell the story very well. And my, and my partners, my more senior partners would say, uh, I don't think this is a great opportunity. And I always struggled to, 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 uh, to understand why, because it's just the presentation, but it's not, right? It's a, really about how does somebody explain what they do in a simple way, in a way that they can understand. And that actually demonstrates how they can do that for all the other constituents, to partners, to customers, to employees, to whoever else uh, is, is important in their business. So actually, I want to double click. You've seen so many entrepreneurs and you've seen them maybe not doing a good storytelling and some doing well, but have you seen some where you can actually coach them to become better at storytelling? Because the coachability of the entrepreneur actually matters for an investor. Yep. You know, we have, <laughs> we have, um, you know, when I've been an investor in early stage startups, that's when it's most market. Right. So when it's an early stage startup, by definition, things are a little more amorphous. They're not completely clear. The value proposition of the product, the maturity of, uh, you know, the go to market uh, and being able to get to product market fit. You know, they're on that journey. And as they get closer to getting to product market fit, their ability to articulate and tell that story gets better and better. That's natural. Right. Okay. So that that happens. But, but I think the specific question you were asking is, are there instances where we have coached entrepreneurs to tell the story better? Absolutely. You know, when you're an early stage board member, one of the things that you can help a startup with is help them raise their next round and then yeah. round after that. And so typically starts off with, hey, come and pitch it to us and then we'll help you tell the story better. We'll give you feedback. That's very much a part of the, you know, value added services that... Yeah early stage venture venture investors uh, provide to their entrepreneurs. That's another golden nugget. And that's also what we do is we say, for the next round of funding, come and pitch to us. Well, as friendly as possible, we're already invested and we're going to give you feedback. That's right. Yep. So I want to go back to education. It's not really education. It was your first job, but I feel like it was so fundamental to what you do afterwards, which is this complex product management and launch, which I think is a filter for how you probably look at all future investments. Can you share about maybe some of the things you watch out thanks to this experience you had at Intel? Yeah, it's actually a great question, Nicole, and I, I'm not sure a lot of other people have asked me that. Um, you know, launching a product like that is, is sort of obviously more complex given the ecosystem it operates in and so on and so forth. And 
what that experience has made me do is sort of always try to think about, okay, what's the next three to four steps that, you know, what are the next three to four to five things that need to fall into place for this thing to be successful? And, and I find myself thinking that way just naturally, right? I naturally go to, okay, well, if this works and if this works, what are the next few things that need need to happen for this company to to succeed? Or forget about succeed, but even to get to a certain revenue milestone yeah. or to, you know, be able to raise that next, you know, uh, great round of financing and so on and so forth. So um, I naturally gravitate to understanding, okay, what are all the possible hurdles that are out there? What are all the the, the unknowns uh, that are out there that that the company needs to, to go figure out? And then, of course, you do kind of a risk assessment of that, right? You're, that's sort of the, just the, aspect of looking at a deal and I'm trying to understand, is this too difficult or is this uh, uh, possible and, and that type of stuff. And, you know, and it's a sort of just appreciate the com complexity of actually getting a product to market sometimes. Yep. Um, you know, in software, it's obviously easier than in hardware typically, but, but even software can be complex. Um, in our case, more relevant to the kinds of investments we make. Some of these financial services companies and fintechs operate in complex ecosystems. Yes. Um, some of the uh, some of the enterprise companies operate in complex, you know, environments within the enterprise, whether it's on prem or in cloud. Um, so, what does it actually take to make a, a product successful, and to make a product successful at scale, which is a whole other you know level of of complexity, right? And so, I mean. Many of these things happen automatically in your head. You're not explicitly thinking about it, but that experience has made me really think about, you know, what are the next several steps and what does it take to scale something? And I think it also helps you to see if the entrepreneurs have already thought about all the steps. You're absolutely right about that because in many cases, they don't necessarily have the answer for it, but how they think about it, how they analyze it and how they respond to you um, that, in fact, uh, is important. And, and so, you know, that's why you build, build that relationship with the, with the entrepreneur over several weeks sometimes before, you know, anything happens, before you give them a term sheet or before you commit to investing. And, uh, and that's important. I want to now move forward to your experience of a financial VC. And it's indeed a really good VC. How much of that financial VC background, which is so different from corporate VCs in some ways and so similar in others, how much of that is shaping how you think today? You know, I think um, when I first came from, from Menlo to, uh, to City Ventures, it was a very different environment. And to some extent, I didn't know how different it was going to be, right? You thought it was the same. Well, I didn't think it was the same. I knew it would be different, but I didn't expect it to be that different. Um, and so what I relied on is just the aspect of bringing experience in venture capital. So one aspect of, of it I was very comfortable with, which is sourcing companies, meeting companies, evaluating them, doing due diligence, yep. you know, and building a portfolio. That aspect of it I had learned, um, you know, through my years at Menlo, and I brought those skills and experience to, um, to, uh, to City. So that's obviously one half of the story. The other half of the story is how do you, uh, operate within a large financial institution and as a strategic. Yep. So the early days, um, we had to start with even some of the basics around what is strategic investing and why, do, why is it important for City to, to do it? Um, what are the strategic rationales along which you would make these investments? How do we measure success? Yes, you can measure financial returns. How do we measure strategic impact? All of those kinds of things, and some of those are actually longer term things, but some of the things we had to figure out and establish in the early days. The other thing we had to do, even at a very tactical level, is establish a investment process for how to make these investments within, within a large financial institution, which obviously is regulated. And so we have you know, additional, additional responsibilities uh, compared to even a regular corporate VC. Um, so we, uh, you know, started to do all of that and, you know, I was lucky in the sense of being in an environment within City Ventures where I had help around me, right? Um, I had come from the financial VC world, but I had people who had been, who were from the corporate world around me. 
And so we were able to bring those two, um, you know, worlds together. I learned from it, I, you know, and they learned from our experience in, in venture capital. And that's why it sort of worked in the early days. You know, we started to, to make some investments. We saw some early good results. Good results, not just from a financial return standpoint, but also from a commercialization, from piloting, evals, insights, things of that nature that we started to deliver. And, uh, and then obviously we've progressed on from there. But the things that I learned at Menlo were, you know, are still crucial today, right? How do you look at a deal? How do you assess uh, the quality of a team? I think it, assessing the quality of a team is one of those things that's easiest to, to mention, but also the hardest to actually do and hardest to, in fact, put, down, put on paper. Um, and, uh, and so that, those are the kinds of things that you um, sort of experience and, and learn by doing, which is what you know, Menlo gave me the opportunity to do. And so bringing that you know, craft of venture capital, if you will, into, into city and to you know, kind of jumpstart this program, uh, that's something that I uh, was able to do because of my experience at Menlo. Very nice. And I think there is a subtitle I want to surface, which is early years in city ventures, very fast iterations. But also, I think you implied some early success stories, which you can then build on top. Can you talk a bit, about, uh, a bit more about that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we um, one of the first areas that I started to look into when I, when, when I came to City was the area of cybersecurity. Again, talking about how I brought my old experience into City. Um, for financial services, obviously cybersecurity is a very important area. It's an area that I had experience in. So I started where I had some experience and where I had some knowledge. And so we, you know, one of my first investments was a company called Silvertail Systems. It was in the online fraud space um, and online security space. And the company ended up having a very nice acquisition in about 18 months or 20 months time frame. So very, that's very an early clear. success story. That's an early success story. And even though that success was not huge, I think it was helpful for the team around me, around City Ventures to know that, you know, this is how it can work and this is how it works and this is what good quality looks like and, and so on and so forth. And um, not only was it a financial success, it also turned out to be a very good vendor to us and a, and a strategic partner at that point in time. Um, so we were able to bring that company in and it actually you know, help strengthen our defenses against various kinds of fraud um, that, that were happening at that point in time. And so um, this is now a old story, right? This is now 12, almost 11 to 12 years ago, and a lot has changed since then. But, but those are important, right? When you put points on the board early, I'm not talking about putting points on a board necessarily financially or personally, but just even as a team, mm -hmm. I think it's helpful to, to showcase that to your corporate uh, partners internally that this is kind of how it could work. So that's sort of where, you know, w one of the areas that I worked on. But that's just me. There are other people also who had similar uh, experiences. And, um, and it comes back to, you know, having a great team and, and, and some good luck. And, and then more importantly, in our case, very supportive, you know, internal business partners. And, and that, will, you know, can, can, can't be overstated. And before this interview, we talked about the importance of team building, of people. Do you have any tips for the audience, people who are thinking about starting a corporate VC or who are very early in the journey, how to think about team building? Yeah, absolutely. I think the building a team is actually probably, as the leader of a corporate venture unit, one of the things that I think about a lot. Um, we um, have been, at, at City. we started with people who had some experience in venture, um, both the se more senior people as well as the more junior people coming in, they, you know, have experienced an, a, an interest in venture, if not have a, actually have some venture experience, depending on their level of seniority. Maybe they were they were in tech in in various forms, um, maybe on the operating side or uh, or in some other way, shape, or form that had expressed an interest in tech. So we would look for those elements. And the thing about venture, especially back then, I mean, it's a much more, it's a much bigger industry. You can even call it an industry now, right? Yep. But it's a much bigger uh, sector now, but it used to be smaller back then. 
And so we wanted to see people who had actually demonstrated interest, had maybe have some experience there, really were curious about venture. So we looked for that curiosity. We, wanted, we were looking for people who really wanted to make a career as venture capitalists. And, and that is true to this day, right? The, the world has changed a lot. It's a lot bigger. There are many more people in the venture capital industry now. But those fundamentals are still true today. We look for people who fundamentally are interested in venture, who um, have some experience with technology, hopefully, who um, have demonstrated their curiosity, and then he, they want to succeed. So we want to see that, that interest and motivation. Um, fast forward to today, I think the way we think about talent is um, in many cases, we've brought in talent and, and people who have um, some experience in venture capital. And then we were able to uh, work with them and they learn from, from, from doing, you know, and because we've been an active corporate venture team, they get hands-on experience in working on many deals, you know, multiple deals a year. Um, we do thorough analysis. We write, um, you know, fairly detailed memos. They learn not just the analysis and the, you know, the, the, the memo writing aspect of it, but also due diligence. I mean, mm -hmm. one of the hardest things about venture is knowing what are the questions to ask. Um, uh, and just, you know, it's, it's, it's not about the pages of diligence. It's more that you, that you document. It's more about the quality of the checks that you do. Yep. And so we try to, um, to instill that in people. And so people, um, you know, learn and they become good investors themselves. And, and then they've, you know, uh, progressed in the company. Now, combined with that, where most of the people who work at City Ventures as investors um, have come from the outside world, we have actually, you know, just as I got recruited externally, uh, most of the people are from the outside world. We've also started to work with people internally who are interested in venture capital, who have demonstrated that curiosity, who have that, you know, innate interest in, in coming into the VC world. And so we want to bring those people in and, and get them to be investors as well. I mean, that's still a bit of a harder task to do, but, you know, we, we want to do that. Um, and, uh, and that way, you know, the, one of the most interesting things about, you know, running a unit like this is seeing those, the people de develop, and that's been, you know, very fulfilling. Um, but it's not easy in the sense that um, – in a corporate VC unit, when people learn, they also end up leaving and, and going and doing it and, and pursuing other great careers, going to institutional venture firms, uh, et cetera. So, so the, in, in some ways, we're constantly looking for new people. We've brought on people, uh, and, and, and it, it ends up being uh, something that, uh, that we need to, to work on every year, um, and that's been the case. So um, I think we've been, I've been lucky that the senior leadership has been you know, very, very stable, but, but the younger people, sometimes they get, you know, great opportunities and they've gone on to build careers and we, you know, stay close to them and, and, um, uh, you know, make investments sometimes jointly and, and so on and so forth. But, uh, um, uh, but that has been quite fulfilling to see people come yep. and develop and become investors and, and, uh, and really rise up the ranks. And continue to contribute. And continue to contribute. Exactly. Now, one thing which is not easy, but maybe you have some tips, is curiosity. How do you assess curiosity when you interview people? Yeah, you know, um, we get sort of many smart, smart people applying and, and coming to us and saying, you know, I'm interested in, in venture. And um, it's not about their, you know, the quality of their experience or academic experience or the firms that they worked in and so on and so forth. They, many of them have worked in brand name firms and so on. Um, what I'd like to see is, okay, so you were interested in venture. So what is it that you actually did mm. um, about it? Um, and that comes through in many ways. I mean, even when you have, you know, new college graduates or people who are graduating from business school, where did they intern? Um, were they part of different clubs? Um, you know, even for undergraduates, I mean, people are now working on the dorm, dorm room fund and other funds that are out there. The venture capital clubs have become very popular in, in, in schools and, and in grad schools. So I think all of those activities just demonstrate 
the interest. You know, you learn, you network with people, you network with like-minded um, fo folks who all might end up end up in venture. So, so that's important. Um, and we like to see those kinds of things just to to um, to know that the person is not just academically sort of interested, but they were they have demonstrated it over time, and they've actually done some things to to uh, learn more about the uh, the industry and the space. Um, and then look, you know, everybody needs a, a break and needs, they need their first job in venture. I was lucky enough to, to get hired by Menlo and that was my first job in venture. And so, um, so then you have to assess sort of just the, you know, whether is the person smart enough? Do they have the right level of energy for this? Are they curious? And then, you know, are there certain domain expertise that they bring that gives them like a, a running start, right? And that's sort of the other aspect sometimes, which ends up being the tiebreaker, right? Where, oh, you know, X, Y, Z worked actually at, in a very similar kind of area in a space. And so uh, he or she can get started even quicker. And so you end up, uh, you know, uh, preferring those kinds of people, though it's not a uh, must have for the mm -hmm. kinds, of, uh, kinds of work that we do. Many of the people we brought on board maybe were working at another growth equity fund or they were working at another venture capital fund. And... And folks like that, they already know how to network, they know how to source deals, they, they know how to look at deals, and that's helpful, even though they may have done it only for two or three years, that's still helpful, and then we, and they end up learning with us. Very nice. Now, one of the challenges you mentioned earlier is the strategic value you're supposed to bring. Very hard to track, very hard to measure. How do you see the journey of you building City Ventures and over time, the strategic values start to become probably more and more tangible. How did you manage at the beginning and how are you doing it today? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there are sort of tangible and intangible aspects of that strategic impact story. Mm -hmm. So there are certain things that we can measure uh, and that we uh, are able to report out on. For example, we have a, a process called commercialization. So one of those key performance indicators for us every year is how many of our companies have entered a pilot or evaluation phase with city, whether it's a business unit or a functional group, et cetera. Uh, second is how many of them actually closed a commercial deal with city. That's the uh, sort of the end goal as far as that is concerned, to be onboarded as a vendor, to be onboarded as a partner, to actually be in business with city. And so we track an entire pipeline companies that are new, maybe where there's not a, you know, no engagement going on, all the way to companies that have signed commercial uh, deals. And in deployment. Uh, and in deployment. So uh, that pipeline we track very regularly, we report out on, and we get measured on that. Then the second aspect of it is how are these commercial deals actually doing? How are they helping City? There, in certain cases, we can measure the dollars and cents benefit. But overall, it's still quite hard, right? So, um, so we end up looking at, for example, we can look at a deal size. Let's say that you know, City contracted with a vendor to pay them three million dollars a year for three years. Um, even though that doesn't tell you anything about the ultimate, you know, financial benefit that that we might get, just the deal size is an indicator of how important yep. uh, a potential partner or vendor is. Um, we look at expansion, you know, are they serving just one business unit or are they serving multiple business units? Are they in one geography or are they global? So we look at those aspects of it. Yeah. Finally, we also look at, you know, examples and case studies, right? So we do case studies of, of uh, companies that, are, that we have partnered with. Uh, what's the use case? Why did they come in? How is it working right now? How did it grow? And in many cases, um, diving into some of the details and understanding the story is almost as important as understanding the overall, um, you know, uh, measurable, you know, KPIs, right? So uh, why did this work and how did this work? And, you know, why is it important? So when we talk to senior executives and, and management, we, you know, tell them some of the stories around here. You know, we brought this company in. They became a partner for us on City Shop. We launched this company. Uh, we launched this product called City Shop, and we've partnered with Wildfire to to do that. And that's an example of of a story where we would, 
you know, be able to narrate that. So I think those stories are important. The indicators that are measurable are important. And so it's a combination of tangible and intangible things that we measure to, um, to be able to uh, assess and report out on the, the strategic impact of what we do. The other part that's even harder than that, but is nonetheless um, an important aspect of, of, of strategic venture, I believe, is the insights and the, the, the learnings that the corporate gets from, from being a strategic investor in startups. And so, um, you know, we um, have a, something that we call BU engagement, so engaging in our collaboration with the business units and functions. And we take a fairly, um, you know, uh, uh, deliberate approach to it. We measure how many meetings we have, you know, what's the engagement, how many companies have we introduced, for example. You know, City Ventures introduces over 100, 150 companies every year to different businesses and partners across City. And you track everything. And we track all of these kinds of things. Um, but there are learnings that you get. You know, what is happening in the wealth space or what's happening in cybersecurity? And then we try to feed that to our partners who work in those areas. And that's very hard to measure, but nonetheless important. You know, sometimes we invest ahead of the business and we learn about a certain area. Um, very early on at City Ventures, we invested in a company called Betterment, which is in the robo-advisory space. And that was the first robo-advisor out there. And then we invested in that company and we learned about software-driven financial advice and software-driven invest investing. And, and then eventually that space became a lot larger and then we learned about it very early on because we were investors in, in Betterment. So in many ways, you know, investing ahead of the business gives us those uh, insights and lessons which we try to feed to our businesses and functions. I think one of the golden nugget is understanding both the tangible and the intangible, but you need that storytelling, that communication part. That's right. How do you build goodwill with the business units? How do you make sure that, I'm sure you have many, many, and through geographies, how do you make sure that you work with the one that needed the mask and the one that may not need or they need it, but they may not know you, uh, you can provide that capacity. So how do you work with this? It's a great question. I think, you know, in a company with a diverse set of businesses uh, and functions, there are always more, there, there are always businesses that are more lean forward and they want to engage with you versus others. Um, the approach that we take in the early days of City Ventures, um, we had to do a bit of evangelical work. You know, we had to convince people that this kind of fintech disruption and innovation was happening in the startup ecosystem, uh, and that it was important for us to pay attention to. And it's important for us to pay attention to not just from partnering with these startups, but also how is it impacting our core business. So. Um, uh, so we had to do a bit of evangelism there, yep. saying, hey, this is what's happening in Silicon Valley. You know, there was a bit of that. And and the previous leadership at City Ventures was very effective in, in doing that. Um, nowadays, it's a bit more, um, it's, you know, people understand the the what's happening in, in the fintech world and in the startup uh, ecosystem. They understand it's important. So then the question is, making it more specific and making it more tangible to the business unit leaders saying, you know, these are some of the things that we can bring in that can help your business. So going to your question, Nic uh, Nicola, I think the best way to build credibility is by, you know, putting up proof points, yeah. right? You know, bringing a company that they actually really end up, it ends up solving a real problem for them. They were looking to to solve this problem. This company ends up, you know, solving the problem for them, or as in the case of Wildfire, enabling us to launch a new product, or in the case of Harness, which is another great enterprise technology company, helping us with continuous software development delivery. When we do that, that's how you kind of build that credibility over time, is by saying, hey, you know, as City Ventures has been able to bring some of these, you know, interesting vendors to us that's helped us solve problems. So that's sort of how you you know do that. Secondly, um, collaboration and how you collaborate with business units um, is very important. You know, um, it's something that I have learned over time. I obviously came from the institutional venture world. And so something that I have had a steep learning curve over, especially in the early days, is how do you how do you work with business units? 
each of these business units is a company of its own and it has its own culture. Um, so you have to tweak the, the engagement model based on the structure of the organization. Um, and the other reality of large companies is, you know, organ sometimes there are reorgs and changes. And so then mm -hmm. tracking those changes so that you can then re-engage with the new leadership. So all of those kinds of things are things that we have learned uh, over time. There's something I love about what you said about tweaking the engagement model. And, and probably most CVCs have one engagement model. Can you talk about how you tweak it? What, what type of things you change, which works in one place and wouldn't work in another place? Yeah, I think the, the engagement model we end up choosing is really driven by the particular business unit or the business unit leader or the functional leader that we're working with. So our approach is to be very collaborative and say, you know, whoever the, the person is, you know, how, how about we do a demo day, you know, every six months. The person might say, you know, that's fantastic, but let's do it for my directs. I mean, I don't need to be involved because this is something where they'll be making the decisions versus me and they're the subject matter experts. So let's do it. And then, you know, actually I'd like to do it every quarter, right? So, so then we sort of end up, um, you know, doing that. But that in and of itself is not enough. We actually go deeper into the organization. Many times the problems that somebody who's three levels or four levels below the CEO, you know, below the CEO, that person is working on is where this is a yep. fit. That person is the one that's trialing these solutions and trying to solve a business problem. So we go to that person and trying to, you know, engage with 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 uh, uh, that individual, while still engaging with the the business unit leadership and the and the senior management team members, so that they know all of this is happening. So it's a bit about having the overall sort of umbrella, you know, where, you know, we're engaging with a certain business unit. The business unit leaders are aware of it. They are supportive of that engagement. And then going deeper to identify specific areas and specific problems that, that need to be addressed. I think we've taken that approach of sort of up and down the chain, um, if you will. And um, and how you engage with, uh, you know, each of that is dependent on the particular particular business unit leader and the personalities to some extent. Um, you know, as our, our goal is to... Um, our goal is to make sure that we bring sort of maximum strategic impact um, to city and and to the the different businesses, and we will do what what it, you know whatever it takes. So we talked a lot about the value you bring to city. Let's talk about how you bring value to the entrepreneurs and the portfolio companies. How do you bring that superpower in a way that city is giving you? Because the way we think about it is, and I I was talking a little bit about you know, sort of having a different value proposition to entrepreneurs compared to traditional VCs. Um, the first thing that we try to do is, um, you know, we come from a place where we sort of understand how startups work. We understand the pace at which things move. So um, we try to fit in with the rest of the syndicate as far as the financial aspect of it is concerned and, and you know, move quickly. I mean, so some of the, the challenges our entrepreneurs have with startups with the corporates is that it takes a longer while to go through the investment process and so on and so forth. We make between 10 and 15 new investments a year. Plus we probably, you know, we do another, you know, 10 plus follow on investments. So our pace is quite, quite fast, but still it might take us a little bit longer than traditional VCs to just close the round. So we try to be quick there. We try to align incentives and make it easier for, for them to work with us. That's at this point kind of table stakes, right? You need to be able to do that. Now, beyond that, I think it's really the the experience that we bring, some of us bring from traditional VC on, and, and being a value-added investor, that ethos is what we bring as well. Mm -hmm. um, first, we become the champion of the entrepreneur inside of city. So, so they know that they have somebody within the city ecosystem that's, you know, uh, speaking for them internally to internal business uh, stakeholders and such. Um, and then secondly, just understanding how startups work and how you add value. So so we started something called a platform function. Uh, we Here we try to connect these entrepreneurs and, and companies to other companies in our network. Um, 
you know, the, the who's who of Global 2000 companies are clients of ours. So where possible, we use those connections to make introductions for our companies. That's a big deal. Because in many cases, these other large companies are maybe interested in the same kinds of things we're interested in. Um, we organize events. And in, in, during these events, we connect these startup companies not only with city folks, but we also connect them with other external folks um, who are in those spaces. You know, if we're doing something in data, we bring people who are working in data at other companies, not just city, to, to some of our events. So we create value, value that way. Um, we, um, we can do social amplification and things of that nature so that they get the benefit of city doing that in addition to uh, their own marketing department doing it. So in those ways, we're trying to add value even above what a potential commercial engagement uh, could be. Um, and, and people appreciate that. You know, we sometimes, we're not always able to publicly talk about our partnerships and our vendor relationships and such, but where it's possible, we talk about it. We put it out there. We, we have YouTube videos and with, with testimonials of, you know, startups who've had a great experience working with City, where they've become, you know, strategic partners. And that's helpful to the startup itself. Uh, and so we try to do some of those things as well. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the platform function. How do you recruit the right people to be in the platform function? Well, the, we've started small, um, so it's not a large team. Uh, and when I say platform function, it's one person who's kind of the lead plus other investors who are involved. Um, and the platform function is very dependent on who you are as a VC. So mm. an institutional VC may think about that differently than a corporate VC does. And even within corporate, it depends on who the corporate is. So in our case, we're a large you know, global bank. What are some of the things that we can provide um, a startup uh, in, in terms of value add uh, relative to the other VCs that they, they may have around the table? And in our case, um, that means we're not going to be able to help them with, let's say, um, uh, you know, recruiting. Uh, we're not going to be able to help them with design. You know, there are some VCs that have those kinds of, you know, services, quote unquote, available to their portfolio companies. We're not going to be able to help them with, um, you know, a bunch of those kinds of things. But we can help them with some of these connections. We can help them with events. We can help them promote their uh, their promote the company as well as their uh, product or services when, you know, in an appropriate way in the right kind of forums. So that's where we have started. Um, where we have put together a tech council where we can sometimes help the, get ad the advice of senior technology members in the ecosystem to, to take meetings, to provide feedback. Um, even with City, um, one of the things we try to do is uh, because we will be, because we are investors in these companies, uh, our city internal partners can take additional time to spend time with them to explain to them how it works, etc. So that, especially for earlier stage startups, they they sort of understand what it takes to work in a larger environment. Not even, not just even large, but also a complex environment like mm -hmm. like city. In many instances, I'm talking about more enterprise companies. Um, and then you know, same with fintech and financial services. They learn what it takes to to work in a much more scaled environment? What are some of the things that we care about? Because we have, you know, just as a fin large financial institution, um, the top of line compliance, risk, governance control, all of those kinds of things. And many startups have to grow there, right? Like first their product and service needs to be live, then it needs to scale, but they also then simultaneously in parallel put those uh, controls and, and risk and compliance uh, controls into, into place. And many times the startups uh, learn a lot about about that just from talking to us, from talking to other internal business partners. So it's in a variety of those ways that we try to add value over and above what might be a commercial relationship. And if I think about your experience as a financial VC, one of the value add is, of course, leading around, building a syndicate, being on the board. How did you bring this into City Ventures and has that changed over time? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we, um, for the majority of the route, ma majority of the situations, we are board observers or we, you know, just have access to the management team. We get information rights and so on and so forth because we may be participating investors in a round, not the lead investors in a round. Um, but we can be and we have been lead investors in a round where we have taken board seats um, uh, as well. 
I think it goes back to my earlier comments, Nicola, about sort of the the type of people we try to recruit, you know, and we we mentor them internally, even the more junior folks, we mentor yeah. them internally on how to work with companies, what to look out for when in that engagement, uh, how to support companies with follow-on rounds, how to support companies with advice. So we sometimes are looking at uh, our members of our team, you know, on how they've been able to add value to these companies, not just on the city side, but even outside of city. Um, and uh, and then we get great comments from startup CEOs. We, you know, we meet them at a conference and they're saying, hey, XYZ on your team has been extremely helpful to us and, uh, and, and so on. So we want to hear those kinds of uh, uh, comments. So I think with respect to board membership and syndicate, you know, where we have board memberships, where we have that kind of relationship with the company, we're able to do it. We are able to, for example, sometimes preempt rounds if it makes sense. Uh, we're able to bring other uh, uh, other investors along in the syndicate. Uh, but that's a minority of the time. A majority of the time, we're more participating investors. And you talk about mentoring. In a way, you're mentoring mentors to entrepreneurs. Yeah. Any tips about how to do it well? Boy, that's a hard, that's a hard, hard one. question. Yeah. Um, you know, I think the only thing I can think about and, and the only way we have sort of know how to do is by essentially having more junior folks work with the more senior folks and watching that interaction. Tag team. Tag team. Um, when I first started in, in venture capital, I, I was an associate and I tag team, you know, two or three different partners to different board meetings. So not only did I learn um, how to interact with, with portfolio company management, the other board members, uh, but I also learned that style from multiple uh, board members and multiple partners of mine. And then, of course, you end up picking your own style and 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 you focus on certain things and other board members focus on other things and so on and so forth. So you actually, over time, learn where you tend to dig in and how you can help uh, you know, companies versus where other people may be, may be stronger. So I think it comes down to that for the more junior people to to learn from the more senior people in terms of how to interact with with, with portfolio companies and add, how to add value. Now, one thing you mentioned is you've managed to make City Ventures fast enough, table stake. How did you do it? Because some corporate VCs are slow, and it's not because they want to be slow. No one wants to be slow, but they have to go through some of the steps inside the mothership. How did you manage? I'd say the 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 very first uh, thing that we did, you know, and this is way back, even when we first uh, you know got started, and I came on board at City Ventures, is to really map out the the investment process very clearly, and saying, you know, this is kind of how uh, this is this ought to work. You know, who are all the people involved? Who are the voting members? Who are who are members that just need to um, need to be aware? So we mapped it out in a very you know granular way. Um, now, since that time, it's actually, you know, our risk and control and governance requirements have increased. So we've obviously reacted to that and made sure that we put the appropriate processes in place. Um, and, but the other thing that we did, and we've been very, very lucky that, you know, we've had internal business partners who've understood it, even though they never maybe had exposure to venture capital as an asset or as an activity prior. In working with us, they very quickly came on board. They, they, you know, this is where some of the prior experience in venture coming from a, you know, financial VC, you know, not just me, but even other people on the, on the team that brought that credibility. And so they were able to, um, to, uh, you know, hear that from us on how these things matter, what matters, what doesn't matter, um, you know, for an early stage venture, looking at revenue projections five years out and trying to do you know, DCFs, all of that doesn't really matter because you're taking so many risks in the in the early. So those are the kinds of things that we had to walk through with with some of the the internal control functions um, early on. And so once that happened, I think at this point in time, you know, we have that engine running and people understand that this is venture. They have, you know, they themselves have, you know, a very good understanding of what's important, what's not important. Um, not that every now and then we have to, we don't have to have some of those discussions, uh, but we've been able to set it up in a way where 
um, you know, the control functions are, are have the have a good understanding of, of the activity and the risks uh, thereof. The other aspect of it is, of course, working with our business partners, right? So um, here, you know, because of our model where some percentage of the companies that we invest in, in fact, the majority of the companies we invest in, in fact, we may be investing ahead of the business. And so we're able to make those decisions a little bit quicker and, and move forward. And then there are others where the business is very interested. And so we're sort of tag teaming with the business to land not just a commercial deal, but also an investment deal. So it just depends on where it lies. But since we have that ability to sometimes invest ahead of the business, that enables us to move a bit faster as well. So I'll double click on this because ahead of the business potentially means you can invest very early stage when the innovation is still fragile, but emerging. How have you thought about early stage versus later stage? Early stage is very good for scouting, but late stage is very good for direct connection and engagement. So how do you think about this too? That's right. Um, you know, I would say it a little bit differently, Nicola, right? Um, when I say ahead of the business, it's actually a point of view of whether something is aligned with current business strategy. Is that something that the business is paying attention to today? Or is that something that we think might be important for the business a little bit further down the line? So it's a bit of an orthogonal dimension than the stage of the company itself, right? So a company could be a somewhat later stage company, but it's maybe still um, a little further out for our business, just given where things stand today. Or it could be an early stage company, but it could be very aligned with the business and it could be very aligned with our priorities currently. So it's, those are two you know, uh, different dimensions, orthogonal in, in many ways. So I'm thinking about more the, the business uh, unit angle on whether they're ready, whether this is aligned with, with city strategy there and whether we're still solving a problem that's here and now versus is this a problem that we think will, will come further down the line or is this something a priority that's going to be a priority three years out, not today, right? So that's kind of what I meant by, by ahead of the business. Stage-wise, as answering that question, we've tended to invest, you know, our, we're, we take a stage agnostic approach. We invest okay. in companies that are sometimes early, sometimes late and everything in between. We try not to do pre-product companies. So we may, may mainly do post-product companies only because it's faster to be able to trial, evaluate it, and to actually do a commercial deal. That way we're not going through the very early product building phase, product maturity phase. We're trying to get to companies where the product is there, it's, it's mature, it, uh, even though they may not have a lot of revenue, um, they're ready to actually uh, come in and, and, and work with City on that. And for the entrepreneurs who are going to watch this interview, what are you interested or excited to invest next? That would be my last question. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're currently thinking about, you know, three areas perhaps um, that, I, that I would highlight. One is in the area of wealth. Um, you know, we think that the fin fintech revolution has come to wealth. We're focused on wealth uh, for the last 18 months to, to two years. Uh, and it's also an area of investment and focus for city as a whole. So it's aligned with city mm -hmm. strategy in that way. And so we've made um, a few investments uh, in the wealth tax space over the last uh, 18 months and two years. And we expect that to be the case even in 2024. Um, so the fintech revolution and disruption that came from other areas of, of financial services is now definitely there in wealth. I think wealth customers expect that those kinds of modern customer experiences and, um, and it's a, an area of focus for, for us at City as well. Second area that I think about, and it's a broader area, is, is this area of embedded fintech. Mm. Um, I think the financial services, whether it's payments, lending, um, uh, you know, could be FX hedging or whatever else, being embedded wherever you are doing business, you know, wherever the customers are doing business, I think that's very powerful because you just remove the, the, the friction from it. Mm. With the technology today, with sort of cloud-enabled services, API connectivity, things of that nature, you can actually make it extremely um, uh, seamless. Um, we started to do this several years ago when some of these apps, you know, the super apps in, in Asia, for example, have hundreds of millions of customers. Yep. So the ability to embed financial services there, and we in fact saw in Asia first, in China and in Singapore and other places. 
and uh, and so um, we started to embed, you know, finan- you know, invest along those lines, right? Embed financial services, uh, whether it may be in vertical SaaS companies or it could be in, you know, other areas. That idea of embedded financial services is very powerful, and we think it's going to, you know, it's going to be important for the next several years. Um, and that can cut across many areas of financial yep. services because, you know, it could be in investing, it could be in wealth management, it could be in payments, it could be in lending, you know, all of the above, right? And then the last is, and, and last, last but not the least, is AI and Gen AI. Obviously a very important topic for the world today, but in, a very important topic for financial services. Um, in financial services, you know, AI is something that can be beneficial end-to-end, you know, from the front end, marketing, you know, uh, personalization, et cetera, all the way to operations and risk and control and, you know, uh, fraud detection and so on. So we've taken a fairly broad-based approach to that. We've been investing in AI, data and AI companies for a little while. And obviously, we're now digging into the gen AI world as well. Like many people. And like many people. <laughs> we're, we're no different in that way. Avind, thank you so much for sharing very openly and candidly your journey and all the learnings along the way. Thank you. Nicola, it was a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I enjoyed it.